Aloha and welcome to Connection to the Cosmos with your host, me, Dr. Lisa Thompson, where I have out of this world conversations with extraordinary people. And today I have Joanne Fawcett on and wait until you hear her bio. <laughs> I can't wait to jump into this conversation. But first, just a couple of announcements. First, if you are coming to Hawaii, specifically to the Big Island, come on one of my Big Island UFO tours where you will get to see the night sky in a whole new way using my advanced generation three military night vision goggles. And if you have not had the opportunity to grab my free 20 minute meditative journey to meet your galactic family and guides, make sure you get that on my website, mysticmanta.com or drlisajthompson.com. And for more information about the UFO tours, since I just forgot to say this, BigIslandUFOTours.com. Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to bring Joanne on. Hello, Joanne. Hello. I, I want to do the Big Island UFO Tours. Yes, come to Hawaii. <laughs> I, I'm going to have to now. <laughs> yes. Well, so let me let me share with you why I'm excited for this conversation, because you you led an interesting life. Let's I have. That. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, so Joanne Fawcett dramatically changed her life after seven marriages that included abuse, divorce, death, and being a prison wife. She never believed in witchcraft, fairies, ghosts, or aliens as a child. In her 20s, she felt the presence of spirits. She left the Mormon church after 30 years and never looked back. She found her strengths, gifts, and inner power embracing the world of magic, elementals, and aliens discovering that many non-humans are very spiritual and also have magic and elementals in their worlds. She learned that it's never too late to follow a new path. Well, wow. <laughs> so, okay. So my first question that I ask my, my guests, I mean, and so now we know you've got a Mormon background. So tell me more about that of growing up and not believing in the ghosts and the fairies and the things being in the Mormon church, and then what led you to leaving the church? Well, first, when I was young, my family was basically Methodist, although my parents hardly, you know, they would drop us off at church, and sometimes they would take us. I remember going to a few Sunday school classes, but it, it we, we did not lead a religious life, you know, but, um, and then some friends, my turns out my best friend, you know, we started going camping with their family and we became best friends and their family was Mormon. So I started going to the Mormon church. So of my immediate family, I'm the only one who joined the church. So, you know, I was raised by, you know, non-members, but doing all the churchy things and they were supportive and that was great. And then I started getting married to a lot of Mormons and it's like, Ooh, <laughs> so, <laughs> who, turned out to, who turned out to be not so great husbands, but so, okay. So curious. So were you married to them at the same time or you divorced? No, no. Five, you know, different marriages. No, only the men back in the pioneer days were allowed to have multiple wives, but uh, the women were never allowed to have multiple husbands at the same time. But I married five out of the seven were Mormons. And it was basically, you know, it's like, I, I, I want, it's like, I assumed that if I was marrying a Mormon or dating a Mormon, we'd be on the same page spiritually, you know, okay, we're going to have this happy family and we're going to pray and we're going to do all the Mormon things. And, you know, and we're going to raise this huge family and we're going to live happily ever after. And, you know, the wife's going to do her little thing and the man's going to be this wonderful, righteous head of the household. And eh. <laughs> basically it's, you do what I say or this, this, or this. And it's like, you know, I'm, I'm a very strong willed person and I'm a Leo and I, it's just every, it's like, and I'm Irish and I'm German and I'm English. It's like, yeah, no, I, I don't really like being dominated. And I, so I don't know why I kept getting married, but, um, and then I had a daughter with somebody who wasn't a member and he died. And so then I just kept getting, well, I, you know, tried the next one. It's like, surely I will find true love. And surely I will have this happy little family that I want for my daughter. And, you know, everything will be roses. And if there was just one type of abuse or not coming, you know, in most of the relationships. And so I just didn't put up with it and left and kept getting divorced. And um, the, the prison guy, he's not, he was not a member. And we were together like 25 years. 
but that wow. that's a whole nother type of abuse and a whole nother type of relationship. So, <laughs> so it's, it's yeah. amazing. But when I met him, it was basically, okay, do I want to go spend most of the, most of Sunday sitting in church or do I want to go visit this really interesting man? And he, you know, visiting him and hearing his stories and just talking about all kinds of things led me to like, oh, I don't really think I need the church anymore. And it, I just start, stopped going and it, you know, no huge repercussions. They kept coming in contact with me to make sure I was fine. It's like, you know, I just don't need it. It's just like, eh. and I started learning about other things and other spiritual ideas. And I learned about, you know, aliens and fairies and, and, magic and it's like oh there's a whole nother world out there that they don't talk about even though there's a lot of mormons who know about ufos and aliens and believe it but they don't talk about it from the pulpit but okay. um yeah so that's that's it i left the church in my 40s and i haven't looked back and i'm doing great without it <laughs> okay well so just i mean before we jump into your experiences with all that um my my, the question, how did you meet the man that was in prison? Was he in prison when you met him? He was. Um, I was I was roommates with a friend at the time. And she her husband was in prison. And she came home one day and said, oh, I met this really smart guy. He was visiting with his mom. He seems really nice. And he was like my age. And the smart part, it's like, oh, that would be an interesting kind of boyfriend. And it's like, OK, I'll meet him. And, and I'd already been to visit a couple of people in the prison. So that didn't scare me or, you know, it was no big deal. And so we, you know, we got approved to meet. Well, we started writing and then you have to get approved to visit. And that took a couple months. And then I just started visiting. And, you know, I was visiting maybe once a weekend. And then it was both days of the weekend. And I think back when we met, there was visiting four days a week. So then I'd go, you know, then it was three days and then there was four days. You know, I'd, my office was near the prison so I could just run over, visit, go back to work. And I, you know, I was the, the boss. So <laughs> it didn't matter. I owned the business. It didn't matter. Um, and so that's it just kind of snowballed, I guess. And there we courted for five years at the prison. We got married at the prison. We've gotten divorced at the prison. <laughs> so. Okay, so you're no longer with him. No. Okay, is he still in prison? He is. He okay. Will, you know, he's technically has a life without parole sentence, so it'll take a bit of legislative magic to get him out. But yeah, not my problem anymore. Okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I, I just I had to go there because I'm sure the audience was like, you know, it's okay. <laughs> line of um, so are you remarried? No, or I mean the, we just got divorced. You know, we. I guess you could say we've been separated for a couple of years because I moved out of his house when COVID hit and, and, and that was COVID. I mean, the, the house is a whole nother issue, but I, you know, couldn't see him for a year. And then we slowly started getting certain visits back. Um, and then, you know, it was, it was like, I started realizing what, what was missing from my life and I started standing up for myself. And so that led to a whole nother relationship issue. That's like, Oh, we do have some problems. <laughs> um, so, you know, we we were negotiating and talking for a, a good year or two, but the divorce was final in May. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, so let's... And not remarried. No, not yet. No, not, not remarried. Okay. <laughs> nothing, nothing on the horizon. <laughs> okay. So tell me how you started going about discovering these other realities outside of the Mormon church that you have now embraced? Well, the alien part is because of the ex. And bless him, he had this phenomenal military career along with his father because the major portion of what they did was dealing with UFOs and aliens and negotiations with aliens and you know going out into space for the military and having conferences here on Earth and just dealing with friendly and not friendly things with aliens. So he... It took a few years before I even knew any of this, um, but, and he was writing reports for me because then I established a nonprofit to start sharing this information. And he obviously didn't tell me everything because it was all top secret. So he could, he could only tell me certain things. And he was always, you know, connected to the military. It's like, can I say this yet? Can I say this yet? So he's never told me anything that will throw him in federal prison or me in prison. Um, you know, we just respect the the secrecy oaths. 
But so he started sharing about different aliens, different alien species, friendly and not friendly, and you know why they come to Earth and what they're all about and just what they're like, which fascinates me. Just how different they are and how wonderful they can be, and and just why they come here. And so that I got because you know I grew up in the I was young in the fifties and we watched Martian movies, you know, <laughs> and they were pretty B rated Martian movies that, you know, they weren't well made, but anyway, they were yeah. the fun Martian movies and, you know, probably terrifying if I thought back about them now, but not as terrifying as some of the current like alien horror films and stuff. So, so that, right. that was, that was fascinating. And I just didn't have a reason not to believe it. Yeah. So, well, so before we move on to other things, yeah. I would love for you to share what you can of what he was sharing with you about, like, because I have my own understanding of why okay. some coming in, but I would love to, yeah. Sure. And I audience is like, what? Tell us, tell us. <laughs> well, there, I, I've learned over time that there are hundreds of species. Mm -hmm. um, some live here on this planet. A few originated on this planet and had to leave and then came back after asteroids and things um, wiped out the planet or, you know, wiped out much of what was here. I, I've learned that there are oceanic species, there are cat species, dog species. I want to meet the cats and the dogs. And there are some delightful reptilian species and one that still looks like there's a couple that evolved from our dinosaurs that were here on Earth. And mm -hmm. if you've ever watched Jurassic World, you know, those are our raptors and they look scary as heck, <laughs> but they've been working with our military since the early fifties. And so that's pretty cool. And they're fascinating creatures. It's like they have, um, now I'm going to get all animated cause I love them, but, um, and they have like a distant cousin who's not so friendly and not so great and evolved into looking more human like, and they work with the terrorists that are, you know, running rampant on the planet, but the Raptors, they have families, they're, they're, uh, sorry, their empire is run by a female. Okay. They have a military. They have a political system, but they love education and culture and bling. And they've learned how to eat certain human foods. And, and many of them have lived here. And with COVID, they all had to leave. But I think maybe some of them are coming back just because mm. COVID would have been probably worse on them than it was on us. But they're fascinating creatures, and they have this vast empire out in space, but they they consider Earth as their mother planet, and they revere Earth, and they're, they can be pretty irritated with us, just like the elementals that we want to talk about, but um, because we don't take care of the planet like we should. Yeah. And, and I've been saying this now for, you know, a good 20 years or so when I first found out about it, but it's like, Come on. <laughs> and, and I'm not a perfect environmentalist, but, you know, I always did the Earth Day stuff and I've tried to do my part. But, you know, they they go to great efforts. Like if they need to manufacture something, they'll do it off planet. And they have very environmentally friendly, maybe underground bases and stuff. But, you know, they're so cool because they're just they're so trippy and they're very spiritual. They're very Zen spiritual. And I've got some great quotes we can I can happy to share. But they've got this dry sense of humor and they're, they're, they're amazing. And they're, if you notice in Jurassic world, like they have different colors for their leather and their, you know, I don't, I wouldn't call it skin. I would call it more leather. Um, but they're just fascinating creatures. I just, and they're so smart. So, yeah, but you okay. know, like, yeah. Do so. Cause what, one of the things that I thought I knew about raptors is that some of them do live inside of earth and inner earth. So is that true from your knowingness? The raptors I know about, they do live in bases underground. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't call it inner earth. I'm not, I don't, I don't really, I'm not a big proponent of inner earth, but I do believe in a lot of stuff is underground. And there are probably other reptilians that yeah. are also underground in what mm -hmm. people probably, in, you know, call inner earth. So that, that's cool. Um, I just, that's not something I'm, you know, that's not what I know about with these raptors. Their, yeah. their bases aren't that far underground, but okay. they're probably enormous. So um, what, 
do you know what their interactions with our military was like? Were they sharing information, technology? They do share information. They do share technology. They help protect this planet. They help mm. us fight our enemies. And they've often joined us in space battles when there's been invading fleets coming to Earth. And when the reptoids join up with human governments like Russia or China or, um, you know, people in Syria, I'm trying to be as open as I can here, you know, when there's terrorism going on and the rap, the rap toys are usually helping and behind that. And usually the Raptors are in there fighting against them with our military forces. So I know there's one picture from when the conflict was going on in Syria several years ago, mm -hmm. there was a picture that was going around and you'd see like um, hostages or prisoners being escorted by some really tall people probably not real people <laughs> okay. because the Syrians were clearly the shorter prisoners and you have these really tall people. The reptoids could be like seven to nine feet. They're, they're huge. And they can look very human when they're covered up. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think they have tails anymore, but if you looked carefully at their feet, I think they still have claws and they would have sharp teeth if you wanted to see them. So, or if they wanted you to see them um, mm -hmm. or if they wanted to take a chomp out of you, but um that, that is one of the best. And I was on a radio show years ago when that was going on. And they are the ones that showed me that picture. And the, I think the host was from Scotland. And I don't know if the show got canceled or the guy passed away or I don't know exactly. But, I you know, that's not the first time I've seen that picture. But they were the first ones that showed it to me. But it's a great example of there are some either really tall humans working with the enemy or there's some non-humans working with the enemy. And that's usually the case. A lot of times you'll hear about a lot of kidnappings, it's the reptoids often that are behind all that, or terrorism is at a school or terrorism at a shopping mall, but you never see the terrorists. And often it's the reptoids. And even, you know, with early days of COVID when there were a lot of protests here in Portland, um, I remember my ex saying, did you see the news? Did you see those people that didn't, that were part of the protesters and they clearly did not look human for a second. You could tell, and I didn't see that newscast. And he said, and right after that, it went off the news. It's like, okay. <laughs> so. Okay. Yeah. Well, so, um, so the, the Raptors, are they like a third, fourth dimensional reality group, physical group? Like they're, they're, very, they're very physical. They are, I mean, and they're only 20 genetic markers from us. So they're very, they're very physical. Uh, they can travel in, they have spacecraft. They can travel through wormholes and, you know, mm -hmm. probably interdimensionally and, and however that works. I don't understand all the technology, but mm -hmm. they are, and they like to steal a lot of technology or borrow a lot of technology, um, but they're very adept with it. You know, that people think, well, how can they do computers? How can they navigate a ship? Well, they do a lot of things with their mind and with mm -hmm. their voice. Okay. But, I mean, they have several, you know, like finger looking things, but they're claws. So they're, right. you know, they're not just a big, anyway, yeah. they're, they're way more okay. advanced than we think. And, and all of these creatures, this is the other thing. All of these creatures are so much older than we are. Yeah. So if we think we're so smart, eh. <laughs> right? Yeah. No. <laughs> uh, well, Everybody's so way smarter than we are. So I would love to know about some of the other groups that are coming and why they're coming to Earth. Well, the, the reptoids again. They originated here. They have bases here. They have bases in space. You'll hear a lot about, or maybe I don't know, but uh, there's a, a group of reptilians called the Dracos. They're really nasty too. They work a lot with the reptoids. They're behind a lot of the attacks these days and they really want to enslave us. Um, I don't know how much they physically come to earth or not. Um, and I was trying to think, the, the, those two are the two main groups that I hear of that are enemies. And there used to be years ago, there were factions of the Raptors that would you know, work against us because in years ago, um, you know, it's like you have an empress, but there's all these royal families that are trying to vie for power and take over power and get their daughter in to be the empress. So a lot of times you're, you're having civil wars. The current empress has been there for a while and my ex is friends with her. So 
you know, she's pretty cool from what I understand. And my spirit guides will kind of give me messages or impressions about her or from her. So, you know, she likes me. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, so are there, cause. And so, there's, oh, okay. So now that I'm thinking. Yeah. Other, other groups, um, like on the negative side, not, you know, we probably don't want to dwell on that. There's, yeah. <laughs> there's an insect group called the trogs and they're kind of a cross between ants and praying mantises. They will, they're like black marketeers and they'll come and scoop up people and take them out in space for bad things. There's, there's many kinds of grays and mm -hmm. some of them work with us and some of them work with like the reptoids and stuff and do a lot of kidnapping. But the grays also, if you're having a big conference between humans and, and aliens, they often work as translators between the different species. So, you know, not all grays are bad, but you know, not all humans are bad either. So, you know, but again, there's, there's lovely cat species and there's some really friendly reptilian species out in space that I really don't know about, but mm -hmm. um, you know, and I don't know a lot about the Pleiadians and I didn't pull up my description. I've got a lovely description of them. Um, but I, I know about some one dimensional species that are, are really cool and very fluid and interdimensional and, and they've helped us. And the, the dog species that I've mentioned, I don't, th their name is um, hard to pronounce, but they, they have a base in Australia and they are just simply merchants. They will Ooh. export commodities that the aliens think are commodities, you know, Rolex watches, chocolate, a lot of, you know, we're selling a lot of chocolate because the aliens love chocolate and bling and silks and things. And um, so they, they, they can defend themselves, but they're simply merchants and they would love to have us as their customers just to, for, in, you know, commerce and interact. The cat, I know of two cat species. One looks like a panther, like a black panther, and they can walk upright and kind of look humanoid if, if they're coming at you from a distance. The one I know, the species I know of the most, they can also, everybody can pretty much defend themselves, but they don't. that doesn't mean they always attack and they don't kidnap. Um, but their species would come to Earth especially, or at least the one I know about the most. She would come, she's an archaeologist, they're scientists, they're artists, they're explorers and she this one in particular would come to earth to see if her species had been on earth before so she would run around and, and either do archaeological digs on her own or maybe go visit sites mm -hmm. and like if you go to go Beckley Tepe in Turkey which I'd love to go you can see the round platforms that used to be spaceports and a, you can see carvings that represent a different alien species that would land there and so it's like, oh, and she's very friendly. And, you know, it's, I keep saying, it's, you know, where my little silly humor comes. It's like, I want to have some big place, piece of property where the aliens can land or come through the portals and we can all just sit and have tea because I'm a big tea person and I want to have tea and sweets and just sit around and talk with the aliens and get to know everybody. Yeah. There's, there's another really cool cat species that my ex came across on one of his missions in space. And they also have a hard name to pronounce, so I won't try it without looking at my notes that I didn't bring them all out. But they're like seven to nine feet tall. They like to dye their fur in either colors or patterns. They can talk with telepathy. They have ESP. Um, they like to sing and hum. And they've got, you know, I, I guess a lot of that comes from the vibrations they feel in their upper lip area. And when they outstretch their arms, their wings, so they can fly, it's so cool. And they, um, it's like, yeah, it's really cool. I want to fly. Um, they, their home world is a sphere out in space somewhere. And it just sits there while everything, you know, moves around it. Um, and so it's, they just seem really cool. And after that particular mission in the late seventies, four of them came back to earth with the X and so there's, you know, somewhere in the Southern Hemisphere, there's like an embassy where all these different alien species come and go and, and stuff. And no, I've never been there, but <laughs> it's off the coast somewhere in the Southern Hemisphere. So I just, you know, there's these, and there's little uh, insect species. Some are like huge and they're called war beetles and they will help the archaeologist with her digs, but they can also protect and defend her against enemies. There's a little tiny bug that, people call, uh, they're like 
the earth equivalent is the little bug. I don't know, tar, I forget the word, but they like went into space so they could see if it could handle, you know, it just looks, it's a water baby. It looks like a water baby. So they could wanted to see if it could handle the extreme temperatures. Well, there is an interdimensional insect species that looks exactly like that. And they came to earth because they were told earth was empty, no humans, no nothing. And their world was imploding or dying off. So they came here, they got tricked and they asked like, oh, there's these, there's humans, <laughs> there's things here. And, but uh, my ex and his team and other humans he was working with that, time, they helped him establish a base. So there's, you know, probably billions of them now and they live underground, but you know, they're just the sweetest sounding little things, but they also have energy weapons. So, you know, you don't have to be big to have a weapon. So just, you know, lots of cool species that I can't wait to get to know someday. <laughs> yeah. Well, so let me back up just a moment because you mentioned that the embassy is off the coast somewhere. So like underwater. Is that what you're saying? I'm not saying it's underwater because I don't know for sure. To me, it sounds like it's just an island off the coast. Okay. And most of us wouldn't be allowed to go there. So um, off the coast of what? Off the coast of a South American country. <laughs> okay. I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say exactly where it is. So I don't know exactly. I know which country it's off the coast of. But we'll just say somewhere off the coast of South America. Okay. Perhaps okay. on the west side of South America. Okay. I just got back from Peru not too long ago. Ooh, so well, you're close. <laughs> a lot of activity. Um, yes, yeah, so I can imagine. America. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. There, there is a lot of activity still down there. And it's, yeah. There, I mean, there were aliens in South America and Central America. And stuff. I mean, they've been all over. Right. You know, and the raptors, um, the, the branch, the family line that I talk about the most, they're, they're, ancestors were from the British Isles. So they like to go visit the British Isles and see where their family might have been. And they get very excited when they see fossils and things that, you know, could have been from their family. And, you know, okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, so, so I'm fascinated because, you know, in some of the shows that I watch on Gaia or other things, people are talking about the um, 20 and back program. Right. And going to the moon and Mars and all these like secret expeditions. Right. So is that part of what your ex was? He was, uh, he was, he was not part of the 20 and back thing, but okay. I mean, he was around aliens from the time he was a baby, but he remembers being around them from like seven or eight and, and up. It was just part of his life because his dad would, there would be these conferences between humans and aliens trying to develop a treaty. And because of who his dad was, he was allowed to go. So he, yeah. you know, he's been around it, seen it. And then, you know, it was just part of his life. He was getting involved as a teenager. So, but he has been to the moon. He's been way out in space. Mm -hmm. He's, he's flown various types of spacecraft. Um, and, you know, people talk about, and I always thought there was one secret space program. Apparently there were, there were several, okay. but he was, he was part of the military secret space program in the seventies and early eighties until he got arrested. So uh, he, he's been, I don't know how far he's been out, but he's been out. Yeah. He's been out way far. He's been, you know, he's been able to travel through wormholes with the Raptors and things. He's done a lot of, you know, the Raptors have trained with us. He's trained with the Raptors because they used to have a program where they were trying to you know, integrate like humans into their fleet so that, you know, the militaries could work together. So, you know, there, there are bases on the moon. There have been, you know, there's aliens have been there for thousands of years. Um, there's cool stuff on the moon. You know, aliens were watching us when we landed there in 1969. You just don't get to see that. I have a picture somewhere of like, okay, here's the, the astronauts and over there, the, the sand dune or whatever it is, is cut off. It's like, huh, they just kind of photoshopped them out. And it's it's pretty yeah. amazing. Yeah. Well, the people who say we never landed on the moon, I'm just like, come on, people. <laughs> like, I, mean, I, I will always say we landed on the moon. Now, yes, did the movie people make up some images maybe as backup, whatever, but we did land because maybe they couldn't show you everything that was really on there watching us as we landed, but we did land yeah. on the moon. You know, we've gone back there several times. There was one mission, I think it was 78, 
could have been 77. It was, might, no, it might have been 77. You know, we had Marines. We had a detachment of Marines on the moon because they were trying to remodel an old alien base into something we could use. And we were getting ready to, like, make live or active a huge new telescope type thing. And there was an invading fleet coming and it attacked all them. They died a horrific death from like neutron bomb, you know, neutron poison, something horrific. I don't even know, but something neutron based and destroyed the base. And it's, yeah, but we've been to the moon and, and we have been to Mars. He won't talk about Mars. Mm -hmm. You know, he can only talk about, he can't talk about anything related to his U S military stuff, but he was involved with, you know, the secret space program, which was under an, another, it was an international security force. So other things, he's told me plenty, yeah. um, way more than his mom ever knew that her husband was doing and they were working together. But, okay. <laughs> you know, but I do know we have something on Mars or we've been to Mars and there's other species with things on Mars. He just can't tell me the specifics. So, okay. Well, and, you know, I, I know we have, um, human type beings inside of Venus that have even come Ooh. to earth. Um, when I was a teenager, I was taken to um, Jupiter's moon Io. To oh, cool. And so I'm wondering, like, has, has he told you about groups, other, like other planetary bodies within our solar system? Did you, um, did you, were you taken there or did you astral travel there? Um, that's a really good question. I feel like it was physical. Wow, cool. Yeah. Um, he has said that, if I remember correctly, you know, there's a lot of groups that might have bases there. That doesn't necessarily mean that's their home world. Um, right. And I know like the Valiant Thor, that group that came to Washington when he was just a little boy and he got to take the pretty girl around and with an airman, you know, show her around Washington. But they weren't necessarily, he, he, it's like, and you know, I, I can't prove what he said cause I wasn't there, but I, mm -hmm. I do believe what he said along these lines, but it's like, you know, they weren't necessarily from Venus, but maybe they're, they were stationed there or maybe they stayed there or maybe it's like, because a lot of species can make themselves look like you want to see them. Right. So, um, but I don't know if they were specifically from Venus or just were there. But and, and a lot of times he has even as a kid, he astral traveled with some other alien kids. But and they went out to Jupiter and stuff and they could see, oh, that that group's, you know, species, they're hanging out here. They have a resort here. And it was it's fun to hear like the non-military stuff. Um, but I, I do know that other species and like the trogs, for example, you know, they like to mine the moons and the the things out there because, you know, there's big mining operations going out there. So one of the reasons why the aliens don't want us out there is they don't want us to know where they live and we might horn in on their commerce. So. OK, interesting. So there are quite a few people that talk about different galactic federations that are out there and that at some point we're going to be become members of maybe that, those federations. <laughs> And so I'm wondering, is that something that he would talk about? I think he only basically talked about one. And, you know, I, I've gotten more insight about that through some of my spirit guides. And mm -hmm. because, you know, a lot of them are human, but they do tap into the, the non-human world. And, and so it's like, and one of them said, you know, number one, be, and this is what I love, be open to the flow of information. So how, you know, it's like, and, and, and discern what kind of information you're getting. But again, all these other species are so much older and so much evo more evolved. Yeah. And back in the six early sixties, when my husband was a kid at this one conference, it's like, he was hearing this, like, they didn't even think we were sentient beings as little humans. You know, we were just little rats. You know, they, we were rodents running around when the raptors left. So it's like, you know, we have a lot of growing up to do to catch up to their level. And we, I, you know, it's like we need to up level ourselves and be more aware and be more conscious. And yeah. um, we need to ex be able to accept their reality and mm -hmm and accept that many of them would like to work with us and, and have some kind of relationship, but we, we need to raise our consciousness and, you know, we just need to get better. And 
did you watch the movie? Oh gosh. Um, it's, it was, for some people it was boring because it was just slow and methodical, but it was where the alien pods came down and there were like one, one in each city. And then like this being was inside and the linguist would go do this language thing. Okay. I can't remember the name. Um, I can't remember either, but I think Amy Adams or one of the. Yes. I loved that movie because she's working on the language and communication and it's like, we have to be ready to really communicate with them, not just shoot them first. Right. You know, cause there's so much we can learn from them. And yes. it's, it's just fascinating. Cause they, they, so many of them are amazing and, you know, they have a lot to offer. And yes. I've beyond what I know about the military stories. It's like, I have a greater appreciation for the different species. Um, yes. Do I want to go into battle with them? No. Um, but do I know that there are some species who are very capable of coming to earth right now and wiping us out? Yes. Well, so I have a healthy, healthy respect and a healthy fear of that, but I don't live in fear. Okay. And so that's something that I, you know, when people come on my UFO tours, um, that is one thing though, that I, I address from my perspective, which is, if they wanted to take over, they could have done so a long time ago. Like they have way more technology right. and are way more advanced. And so my understanding is that the majority, not all of them, but the majority of the ones that are coming to earth and interacting at least with humans are because they're our family, because we have up to 22 different races in our DNA that yeah. have come modified us. I, I love our... that. I love that. And you know, sometimes they come here for vacation and sometimes they just come here to explore. <laughs> That's my husband. He's like, yeah, they're because we have so many here in Hawaii. He's like, they're just, you know, they're on vacation. They're doing a drive by on this beautiful place. <laughs> well, and I loved, um, and you know, when I gave a talk about this several years ago, people just thought I was nuts. But when the ex was you know, maybe just out of high school or maybe the summer before he was out of high school. I, you know, back then. Okay. So it was, you know, 17 or 18. He went to this training where he was training with the Raptors, you know, space fleet. Okay. And part of their, you know, they had like a, they had to go out in space for like their last big test. And so while they were out there, they did their test. And then they saw this like cruise liner. <laughs> a space cruise liner, because there's the aliens on vacation. Just like I went on my cruise to Alaska in May, they're on a cruise going around space. <laughs> How cool is that? <laughs> right. But a lot of them, you know, he said he, you know, a lot of them do come here for vacation because this is a, a, this is a magnificent planet. Now, the sad thing is if you happen to see them across the Canyon where you're hiking and they're hiking over there with their family, they might have to come eat you because you're not supposed to see them. There's technically the treaty is no interaction with civilians and aliens. Mm -hmm. So they're probably not going to jump over and say, hi, can we hike with you? Yeah. Sorry. But um, they do come here for vacation and they, they, you know, many of them, because especially the Raptors, because they're from here originally, they love it here. You mm -hmm. know, I think they would like it to be more jungly. <laughs> so, because it used to be very jungly when they were here. But um, yeah, a lot of them do come here and a lot of them come here to explore and just check us out and study us because we're interesting and strange, I think, to many of them. Oh, so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, so based on um, some of these groups that you talked about, so you've said, you know, the Raptors, they have culture and they have, right. you know, their own system of things. So are there other groups that you're aware of that have spiritual kind of ideologies or understanding? Because I know my higher dimensional ETs that I work with and communicate and channel, they definitely do. So oh, I, 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 I only know, and I, my specifics are with the Raptors, but I know like the war, the war beetles that I talk about sometimes they're very Zen like, and there's other, other similar, I haven't studied enough into that side of things that I'd like to. Okay. Um, and, you know, he had started writing almost like a little encyclopedia about various species, but then we split up and I have to leave the paperwork there. Okay. <laughs> so I didn't get to keep all the paperwork. Um, so, but okay. it's, but 
but it is interesting because the Raptors kind of, uh, you know, have this, and I'll, I'll read this quote whenever you're ready. It's like, they just, everything is infinite to them and everything is wonderful. And just because you can't see, you know, you don't have eyes, it doesn't mean you can't see. Mm -hmm. And so, and again, it's like some of the species, they have their own elementals. So like if they come to earth for a conference, their elementals are translating with ours. There are many species that have witches among them and, and, you know, I think a lot of our earthbound, you know, earth witches, especially in the British Isles, got a lot of their information from various aliens. So because it's all science and natural laws, so that doesn't change. Okay. No matter who you are or where you live, it's just, you know, natural laws are natural laws. It's not hocus pocus. You know, I keep trying to have, how do I explain that part of my life? It's like, I'm not doing anything huge and flashy and you're just using natural laws and intentions to get what you want, basically. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. so are you able to, so the ex that you're talking about is the one that's in prison, right? That has yeah. experiences yeah. of. So is he in prison for stuff related to this or something? No. Um, well, yes and no. The, the public story is that he was arrested and convicted for masterminding the murder of somebody that got killed in the early 80s. Now, he also has a history of pissing off like the New World Order and enemies of the kind of work that he and his father and that branch of the military would have been doing. So I really think behind the scenes, and I've talked about this openly at all the conferences I used to talk about, it's like somebody in, in that kind of realm, he pissed somebody off and, mm -hmm. you know, corporate or military or government, and, you know, they found a way to frame him or they either set it up from the beginning or they just used that as a convenient scapegoat. And, you know, because then he couldn't say, well, I was really doing this for the yeah. my military job that day when that happened, because that's top secret. And to this day, he can't tell me, he goes, all I can tell you is I wasn't there. Yeah. And he can't tell me where he was. And the government is not going to back him up. The government is not going to reveal what they were doing just to keep, get him out of prison. Right. That, that doesn't mean he's still not in the loop with the military and still not consulting with, you know, it's like, for as far as I know, he's never retired from the Navy. <laughs> okay. Interesting. Well, so, so it's interesting because I used to feel like I was very much in the loop when we were talking. So, yeah. oh, a kitty. Yay. Yeah, I sent deep. mine to the other room. <laughs> Hello. Hello, baby. <laughs> so, um, what, you know, so now Congress has made it a lot easier and safer for whistleblowers to come out, right? And share kind some of. information, kind of. So what's your assessment of all that's going on now this year? And I again, mean, you know, for for as long the military has known about all this stuff from the 20s, 30s, forever. Yes. Um, yes. You know, his grandfathers were both involved with all this. His dad was always involved with it. So it's not a new thing. And the military is never going to quite say, at least not anytime soon, that, oh, yes, they're real. They're here. There's this many. And let me tell you all about them. Um, but they have documents about the kinds of species. They have documents about their agendas. and all. And I used to sell... I don't think I have a digital copy of it, but I used to have a document about what to do, basically, if you encounter extraterrestrials. And it was very military-ish, you know, all these points. It's like what you do if you, inter you know, come in contact with aliens. And it's like, wow. So, you know, they, you know, we're dealing with this. Um, I just think whatever disclosure we're having, that's great. There's, there's some people who have stories and information who have never seen a UFO or an alien. Now I've never seen an alien, but we're not technically supposed to, I'm not supposed to let my Raptors come to tea. Um, but I have seen beyond the X talking with the X. I have seen UFOs, mm -hmm. you know, with him and without him, we saw one come right over the apartment. We were having a family visit out and it's like, Whoa, you know, it was like right down a thousand feet above our apartment. It's like, you can't not know that that's what that is. And right. I've seen them, you know, in California and I've seen them in England. So they're, they're all over the place. Yes. Um, so that being said, I, I love that all these people are trying to help with disclosure and that all helps because more and more people are becoming aware of it and more 
you know, accepting of it. Um, but the military, and in fact, uh, I have like a timeline. It's like, okay, 1961, there was a conference. In 1971, there was a conference, and these were on Earth. Mm -hmm. Then there was going to be one in the 80s, but the Falklands War happened. So then they have little side things, which people thought were like environmental conferences. And, and you know, okay. Then you move fast forward to 2011 when Kate and William got married. And, oh, like right after that or right on the other side, you know, behind that wall, there's an alien conference going on. So they've been having the conferences. You you just can't talk about it. And it, it cracked me up. It's like a couple years ago. Um I, I don't remember. And it might have been like for the Queen's Jubilee or, you know, one of her last big celebrations. She had all these heads of state and people having a big party there at Windsor. I guess it was at Windsor, but I don't know which place it was, you know, and you can be sure there were aliens close by. <laughs> so okay. it's just and all the government heads know about this stuff and all the huge, you know, the heads of the big churches know about all this stuff and they're in communication about all of it. So. So what do you, besides control and maybe power, what would be the reason why they would want to keep it hidden from us? You know, he always told me that it was because they figured the public couldn't handle it. Um, and I suppose a lot of people would just probably commit suicide. Okay. Um, and I don't know. But so a lot of people wouldn't be able to handle it. Other people would maybe embrace it. I guess it depends on if it's a friendly invasion or a not friendly invasion type of thing. Okay. Um, so I guess the circumstances would dictate how we react. A lot of them thought, oh, well, the Christian churches are just going to fall apart because, you know, a lot of the things we thought in the Bible were really aliens talking or really aliens coming here or those angels that you thought were angels were really aliens. It's like, now I get that. It's like, oh, so Joseph Smith was not talking to God and Jesus. No, he was talking to aliens. Like, I totally get that. It's like the gold plates. What about that? And it's like, I don't know if those are real or not. But a lot of it is about power and control, because look at how much control the religions have over the world. Right. And even, you know, a lot of aliens wanted control. So they would say, well, I'm your God type of thing. And in the conference in 1971 that happened in Iran, the lovely cat explorer archaeologist person, mm -hmm. um, you know, her job before the conference was there were like nine species who said, hey, I created humans. I should be their God. I no, I created humans. I should be their God. And she went around and found evidence that no one alien species created humans, but they they've helped enhance Yes. The humans. So no one species can say I should be their God because they, you know, there was no one species that created us. And it's just, it's so fascinating to me, all this stuff that's come out. It's like, well, let's have her sit down and do a lecture. Come on. But I, and I, I started publishing that, um, the big long report about this Iran conference, because it was like thousands and thousands of pages. And I never, I never got the ending part from him. I knew what happened, but I never got the ending part where she presented her findings, for example, about that one thing. But it was a whole big treaty conference. And, and the one in England, they, you know, they banned open communication for 50 years and then renewed it at that the conference right after Kate and William got married. So, you know, there is a ban on open communication with humans and aliens. So it's frustrating. <laughs> well, right. Well, it, except for, you know, there are a lot of us that yeah. are communicating with them. That's great. I love that. And, I love that. And, you know, my job is to have people understand some of these groups, but primarily, like, I I tend to stay out of the fear-based ones mm -hmm. messaging because right. all timelines are existing simultaneously. And ultimately yes, I learned that. I didn't ever know that till a few years ago. <laughs> okay. And so... Ultimately, whatever frequency we are vibrating at is what comes into our particular space. And so even though there are some, we'll call them negative types or polarized, they're still polarized, just like humans. Right. Um, th that doesn't mean that if someone is vibrating in a really high frequency, they wouldn't ever experience those right. low vibes. Right, right. right. It's interesting. Um, a friend of mine, well, two friends of mine, they did... I wouldn't, it's not a tarot deck. It's more of an Oracle deck 
about guidance from different aliens or like especially lessons from your alien family and, and, and other things like messages for you. And she did a reading for me once and it's like, Oh, um, and I don't know if I ever got the answer about like what alien family I'm from, but she goes, Oh, you're supposed to go teach the Pleiadians. It's like, and she goes like out there. I was like, Oh, well, okay, cool. <laughs> I love being a teacher. So it's like, sure. I'm ready to travel. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? I mean, you know, I I, I love and I'm going to give a talk in um, the Bay Area, California in October and, and combine my new my new love for like the spiritual or, you know, what the species are like and you, how they over over, you know, over they connect with the elementals and the spirit because the magic and the elementals and they all love this planet. So, yeah, you know, yeah, Beautiful. yeah. Well, we're running out of time, but this is just so fascinating. So I would love, um, you, you said you had a raptor quote. I do. It's my favorite thing in the world to close any kind of talk with, because I used to cry every time I gave it, but I'll try not to cry. Okay. And this was given by a raptor senator in 1971. He was 300 years at the time, 300 years old at the time. And from, a, you know, the last couple of years or so, I mean, he was still alive a couple of years ago. So okay. anyway. the galaxy's great spiritual thinkers from every sentient species have taught the wisdom of seeing beyond any appearance of lack or limitation because they recognized the natural perfection at the heart of all of life. They saw the greatest possibilities. They knew that wholeness, beauty, peace, and harmony were always present and would express if recognized and embodied. These spiritual masters saw their world with eyes of wonder and awe, even if they had no eyes. They teach us that each of us lack for nothing. Each of us is part of a universe so abundant that it is impossible to count or comprehend the reach and richness of it. Infinite means never-ending, never ceasing, always replenished, always greater and more beyond imagining. You have the access to the in infinite. Your nature is part of the divine and the divine is ever giving, ever pouring forth with anything and everything that is needed. The universe would not exist if it were not a self-sustaining and continuously expanding system. Each sentient life is part of this system and you partake of its nature and composition. Like the water that makes up most of the human body, the infinite abundance of the universe is inherent in and as you. There can be no separation or a canceling out, a defeating of both would happen and nothing would exist. Beautiful. Isn't that lovely? I just that, love that. Yeah, that is. And that is an amazing, an amazing way to end yeah. this segment. And so I just want to thank you for oh, coming. Thank you. And this sure. has been a lot of fun, and I'm coming to Hawaii now. <laughs> yeah, you're college, and then you know, maybe, maybe there we'll have you back on again, and you can. Oh, great! Anytime. I love talking about this stuff. <laughs> and so I appreciate you being here, and thank you to those watching or listening, and thank I'll you. see you next time. And thank you for what you're doing. Oh, you are welcome. It's my it's my mission in life, really. <laughs> so. Okay, and I'll see you guys next time on Connection to the Cosmos. Thank Aloha. you.